everyone. Um, please welcome Anne Smith and Mike Dowling uh, with their talk, Open Collaborations, Leadership Succession and Leadership Success. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm Mike Dowling. I've been working in ICT for three decades, moving from programming through user support, uh, network administration, and most recently, event and incident management and uh, enterprise level system monitoring. Uh, back in 2014, I came across some videos on YouTube uh, that brought my attention back to a game I'd first heard of thanks to this XKCD strip. One more. Dingo. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Kerbal Space Program, uh, KSP, it's a game where you build rockets for little green people to fly into space, uh, making a uh, pretty solid attempt to accurately model two-body orbital mechanics. Uh, it was Scott Manley's videos that really convinced me to actually purchase and start playing Kerbal Space Program uh, four months after that comic particularly his Interstellar Quest series, which featured his use of a series of collection of mods. Uh, so when I started playing KSP, it uh, didn't take me long to dive into the mods that were available to add to the game experience, adding extra information about what your craft is doing at a given moment or new parts to build your craft or making the physics slightly better or just adding extra visual and sound effects to make the game a little nicer. KSP has got a very active modding community. The uh, KSP Community Mods and Plugins Library Google Spreadsheet lists over uh, 1,200 mods, and that only includes mods that have been active since the 1.0 release of KSP. Uh, there's some complex mod dependency chains uh, and uh, incompatibilities, with each developer having their own notion of the easiest way for users to get their mod. I dove in head first, and it wasn't long before I was using over 100 mods uh, and starting to have difficulties getting a game that would actually play. Uh, so some mods included their dependencies in their download, some of them included modified versions of those dependencies, and uh, it, it was taking me more time just to manage my mods than I had available to play the game. Uh, that was when I found the CCAN, and everything got way better, and then absolutely terrible two years later, and I ended up in charge of a FOSS project. KSP CCAN, known informally as the CCAN, is a software repository, client, and metadata collection for game mods for the Kerbal Space Program. Paul Fenwick, or PJF, noted Pearl Hacker, that some of you may, have know, may know from talks he's given at Linux ConfAU and other conferences, uh, was an avid KSP player and a user of many mods. Uh, his experience with the comprehensive Perl archive network led him to decide to implement the comprehensive Kerbal archive network, or CCAN. That name was already taken by the open source comprehensive knowledge archive network, so he appended KSP to the name. Since Kerbal Space Program and most of the mods written for it are written in C Sharp, uh, PGF decided to use that for the CCAN and released it under the MIT license. Now, we're not really here to talk about the CCAN itself, we're talking about FOSS project success. So, is KSP CCAN a successful project? Well, there's many ways to measure success when looking at FOSS projects. We can look at the project's lifespan. The um, CCAN started on GitHub six years ago in 2014 with the first official stable release on 14th of November of that year. We can look at project activity. Uh, 1,816 issues and feature requests have been raised on our main uh, GitHub repository. We can look at the team effectiveness. 88% of those issues and feature requests have been closed. Uh, we need to consider concurrency. 124 releases to date with the latest V1.26.6 coming out on the 24th of November last year. And participation. GitHub says that at various times, 16 different core developers and another 62 participants have delivered a continuous stream of regular updates with a total of 84 GitHub watchers and 1,033 stars and over 500 separate contributors identified in Git commits. A user base is hard to measure, but the latest release has had over 72,000 downloads with one release that stayed current 
for five months, hitting over 150,000 downloads. Uh, the CCAN has got some recognition from the Kerbal Space Program developers with a pinned thread on the uh, forum, community forums. And several YouTubers have posted videos showcasing the CCAN and introducing it to their audiences. Today, the CCAN lists over 2,000 mods across every KSP release from 0.25. Uh, with growing maturity and stability in the modding community and gradual refinement to our processes and systems, most mod releases are automatically added to our metadata collection within a few hours of their release. Our infrastructure guru, Leon, gave a talk Monday morning about some of the work done to achieve this. All things considered, we have to call KSB CCAN a successful project. But why was it successful? Anne's got a few ideas about that. Sorry about that. We're here to talk about success, and the other thing we're here to talk about is leadership. Now, I was researching some leadership issues recently, and in comparing the CCAN with other FOSS projects, I couldn't work out what was different. It really didn't stand out from the rest of the project, particularly, except by being successful. Which raised for me the question, on a research level, given the flat organisation of FOSS projects, how does leadership impact success? I'm Anne Smith. I'm doing sessional teaching and researching at the Australian National University in project management and information systems and leadership. And to help answer that question, we have around 43 papers on leadership and FOSS projects uh, from high-impact peer-reviewed journals. Now, I want to be clear, your mileage may vary. But if it does, and there's 1.4 million papers have been, uh, projects have been assessed, and they point at something else, I strongly recommend that you ask yourself what's different about your project. Something is. And it will affect every aspect of it. So, in making this presentation, the main content will be up in the top box, in the usual place. That green bar down the bottom will have names and dates. Those are references. And if you are interested in following up on any of this research, let me know those details and I'll be able to get hold of papers for you and send you copies. Inside that circle at the other end, you'll find some comments, sometimes like literature review or 307 GitHub projects. And it just gives you a sense of the evidence base that sits behind some of this research. So given the key characteristics of a FOSS collaboration, what does Conway's law look like for a FOSS project? The first thing is that FOSS projects are primarily modularized, and that's encouraged by the knowledge base of the participants who are already biased towards object-oriented design of modern programming tools. This wasn't the case back when they started in the 1990s, but it's certainly the case now. And so the product will tend to be very modular in design. So what we can see is the team is already constraining the product. C derivative languages, I think you mentioned C sharp, um, are predictors of success in their own right. Use of C sharp and its derivative, uh, C derivative languages are predictors of success for FOSS projects because they increase the potential pool of developers that you can draw from. Portability is another success factor. So in choosing common and portable object-oriented tools to set up the CCAN in the first instance was a very smart leadership decision. From the perspective of the technology, yes, you can all get that. But it was from the perspective of the organisation as well. Now, the second thing is that because of the low bar to participation for FOSS projects, you've got little structure to your team. You've basically got a bunch of individuals. And so what's happened is that a unique process of layered development, the technical term is open superimposition, uh, has evolved, whereby um, typically FOSS projects develop with sequential self-assignment of tasks. 50 to 60% of tasks will be self-assigned um, on the basis of the developer judging that they can actually get this piece of work done in their available time. That's fine, and it works up to a point. Problems arise as sequential development by individuals discourages co-work. And so, technically, uh, you can get long delays. Um, one, one example is nearly half of 
maintenance issues or issues that are logged do get resolved within a month. Almost half of them are actually resolved in, in around a week. Uh, and one study found three days was the median. So the very, very quick turnaround. The problem is that the other half never get resolved at all. And that was on a, uh, um, a uh, major study um, of 9,447 um, developments. The problem is that resolution of these other 50% requires somebody to lead the developers, multiple developers, through a coordinated process. It's not going to happen automatically. Organisationally, delays can lead to perceptions of loss of control, frustration, feeds back on the system as lower quality. Overall, FOSS has co-evolved with time-constrained participants in time-unconstrained projects, and by and large, it works. But it's evolved. And the problem is this. Evolution requires the survival of the fittest, and that means the demise of the less fit. 83% failure rate. 83% abandonment rate on a study of 175,000 projects drawn from SourceForge. Now, I want to be clear, reality check, business startup failures are pretty high too. But FOSS projects are worse. 83%, not down at the 32% for large-ish uh, startups in Australia. Nonetheless, you know, nobody's expecting it to be a hundred percent success rate, but 83% is a pretty horrendous um, failure rate. The problem is this. Anybody who attended Leon's presentation on Monday will understand how critical modularity is to the technical <laughs> success of the project. Um, but the thing is, technical modularization may not be the answer. The fact that the, the uh, CCAN survived for quite a long time with a significant function in a very unmodularized form indicates that. Many of those failed FOSS projects were, in fact, very well modularised. Small teams might even not even need a lot of modularisation to survive and prosper. One person, one system, hey, you, you can live with it. The implication of this is we have to focus on the structure of the organisation to look at where success will come from. So, question is, how do FOSS projects organise? Typically, they start small with a founder, probably one person maybe two, three. They may grow, typically, to 2.3 on average. Maybe around three is, you know, I mean, four, five, six, seven is quite a big project by FOSS standards. What you get around the project is an invisible belt of system users emerges. And out of that emerges a periphery of people who actually get in touch usually with something small, a, a feature request, a bug fix, a request for information. And then out of that coalesces a core of developers, some of whom are only spending a very small amount of time, but some of whom are spending more time. There's a definite two-layer structure emerges at this point of the core developers and the periphery. You'll see some kind of formalisation at this stage of, of access rights to communications, to forums, commit rights and so on, in order to enhance the efficiency of the overall running of the system. Not to set up a hierarchy, but to enhance efficiency, to improve coordination. And Mike's going to talk about what the implications of that process are for leaders. So... Uh, I came into the CCAN team very much via the belt to periphery pathway, having struggled for a while with heavily modded KSP installs and that turned into crashing misses and being familiar with the concept of software repositories. I installed the CCAN client and started using it in, to, to manage my mods around December 2014. Uh, I gradually progressed from asking questions on forum threads to raising issues in the metadata repository and Eventually, in May 2015, I was raising pull requests. Uh, so, along the way, I had some fabulous chat sessions with PJF, where he gave me a lot of help in using GitHub and installing MonoDevelop and setting up my computer so that I could actually work with the tools that the team was using. And uh, 
and just chatting about stuff generally as well. And all of that really encouraged me to become, to feel welcome as part of the team. Uh, indeed, the research tells us this sort of socialisation process is how project standards and expectations are distributed from core developers to the uh, uh, project belt and periphery through direct discussions, forum threads, and even reading the code. We know that people in the periphery of the project provide beta testing and limited debugging functions, uh, which can be part of the back and forth between the periphery and the core as part of a bug report or feature request, but also just as a result of their own usage requirements. They often engage in group social management, as I did, contributing to the CCAN forum thread uh, and convincing fellow users to focus on improving the metadata for everybody rather than trying to work around the system. And all of this is predictably short-term tasks with quick turnaround. The people in the periphery are happy to undertake a quick task but may lack the skills, motivation or available time to engage in a long process. Uh, now, as I gained a greater understanding of how the CCAN's model release scraper worked, uh, I gradually started to become one of the major contributors to the metadata repository and was formally inducted into the team, making some small code contributions around March 2016. Uh, and that's the other really important feature of the periphery, providing future developers or other core team members. Uh, now PJF modelled exactly the sort of behaviour that encourages belters to become periphery members and periphery members to join the core. It's worth taking a little extra time to chat and even coddle interested people to some extent. If you make people feel welcome, they might stick around. If you brush them off with nothing more than a link to an FAQ, you're relying entirely on their self-motivation, which may not be enough if they have more appealing options to uh, spend their time and effort. Now, PJF discussed a lot of this in his talk at the Open Source Developer Conference in Hobart in 2015, and I seriously recommend you uh, check out that uh, talk at some stage. Uh, and um, Anne's going to give us some more details from the literature. ...to overcome the uh, barriers to participation. Past research has found a tendency for FOSS teams to self-socialise into self-reliant individuals bonded by something of a, a baptism of fire. It worked up to a point in that it built teams that were very homogenous and were bonded, but the problem is it lost a lot of potential participants. This reduces team size. It also reduces your team diversity. And there's a whole raft of barriers can get in the way. There's around 15 that have been identified in the literature. The most important are the ones that Mike alluded to, which are around socialisation. Team size is a double-edged sword in success. Okay? It's, it can work before you or against you, but I will say that certainly in the early stages of a small project, when you've only got one person, two is better. I will also say that if you've got a vision of building a better version of Linux, you better have more than one person to do it. So there is a point where you want to be able to get more people. The second thing that is much more important, though, because it's important for all projects, is when you lose people through brushing them off, you reduce your team diversity. And yet team diversity has been demonstrated to be a significant success factor in FOSS projects. What do I mean by team diversity? You want people who have been here a long time, old timers, you also want newbies. You don't want too many of either, you want a balance, 50-50-ish. Why? Because if you've only got developers, core developers, what's going to happen when you run out of them? Where's the people who are doing the testing? Because developers don't want to do that and they don't want to write doco, I learnt that yesterday. Uh, but if you've only got newbies, of course, you've got nobody working on the code either. So diversity of tenure, diversity of background, things like language and culture give different perspectives, diversity of contribution. Uh, some people, you want multiple people giving, bringing in different skills. There's a whole raft of things around diversity. But the bottom line is, the more people, the more diverse your project, the higher your likelihood of success. Leadership is needed to make sure that these twin organisational needs are addressed through recruitment and induction. 
So that's looking at the overall size and composition of the project, but within the project, what participation rates can you expect? And the answer is that from the core to the periphery, you can see an in increase in size of an order of magnitude. So you might have five people inside the core, and you might have 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 people in your periphery. And that's pretty normal. The problem is, of course, people look at it and say these 30 or 40 people are freeloaders because they're not doing very much, and that's the uh, other side of it. As you go from the core to the periphery, you see a order of magnitude decrease in the amount of effort that they put in, the amount of time. So whereas a person in the core might be putting in, say, 12 hours a week, a person in the periphery is more likely to be putting in something between one and six hours a week. That's figures from several studies. Um, the size is in line with sociology research, investigating feasible group sizes, the idea of the uh, order of magnitude jump from the core to the periphery. So it reflects fundamental social patterns and is likely to be stable. Realistically, the fact that the order of magnitude drop uh, in effort means that you've got roughly a one-to-one -one correspondence in work availability from the, the core and the periphery. And the rule of thumb since the 1960s for information systems has been one hour of coding, one hour of supplementary work. You know what I mean? Requirements analysis, documentation, testing, debugging, all the other stuff, implementation planning, all the rest of it. So actually it's a very stable structure that's emerged without a lot of planning. More dual, uh, complex dual layer structures can also emerge, but the key point here is this. Flat structures are not stable. You are going to get a complex of dual layer structures emerging. There's a couple of intervention points where leaders can boost the likelihood of success for the self-structuring network. But the thing is this. Leaders only put in an extra two hours a week, roughly speaking, in most studies, over and above the core developers. So in other words, if a developer's putting in 12 hours a week in one study, they found that the, the leaders were putting in around 14. Now, if you've only got two hours a week to do something, you're going to have to prioritise it. And our recommendation to you is this. Prioritise the periphery. Encourage people to participate, as Mike was talking, because that's where you're going to get your future. Remember that those people are drawn in by their personal needs for a bit of information, a request of, for, for how to do something, maybe a bug to be fixed. To address those personal needs generally takes between one week and one month. That is the time window that you have to get in and create some other need to stay and work on this project. Now, you saw earlier in that slide with the, with the one with the box, there's 15 key barriers to long-term participation and leaders have to take the lead in overcoming them. The most important do relate to socialisation. 75% of those studies mentioned that one. There's a bunch of other ones. They all need to be addressed. But that is one of the key outcomes from the research about predicting success. So what we've been looking at so far is the people inside the scope of the project that form the organisation, but FOSS projects also network via people, via componentry, via information. So you might have people on one project are also working on another project. That builds their knowledge and brings new ideas and new concepts into your project. You might be using componentry, and that, again, allows you to learn more things from other, code, from other projects because, of course, the code is, generally speaking, the code base is open. Cross-linkages between your project and other projects are a major success factor in FOSS projects. They assist your project primarily through information sharing. But those linkages also create stakeholder relationships. And we're going to talk about that right now. So, Mono is part of the KSP CKN's network, uh, but there's another bunch of projects that the CKN is inextricably linked with. Uh, throughout the history of the CKN, there's always been a low level of friction between some mod authors and the CKN team, some reasonable and some not. The reasonable complaints came down to a fairly simple problem. Uh, the CKN would install or upgrade the, a mod in a way that left it not exactly as it ought to be, 
which led to the user complaining to the mod author, and the mod author would be tearing their hair out, trying to work out what was going wrong, why they couldn't replicate the issue, uh, until the user mentioned they were using the CCAN. And at that point, the annoyed mod author might come storming into the CCAN thread or our GitHub, uh, demanding that their mod be removed from the CCAN. And here was the issue. Some of these authors had released their mods under open source licenses. So they fundamentally didn't have any right to demand that their mod be removed from a software repository. Uh, but their assumptions and perceptions about copyright meant they felt they ought to have some control over distribution. Uh, and to complicate this further, there were an awful lot of different mod authors who all had their own individual assumptions and perceptions, none of which was written down anywhere. Uh, to address all this, the CCAN adopted a policy document, uh, a document based on the principles of free software, which stating that the CCAN put its users first and would not delist FOSS mods. Uh, this policy was written from the perspective of someone who is familiar with the copyright limitations, uh, copyright implications of FOSS licenses. Uh, now remember the fundamental issue, as I said before, was one of the CCAN client messing up installs, which we raced to sort out every time we heard about it. So from the CCAN perspective, these mod authors were getting all head up about one of two things. A, temporary issue we were trying to fix and asking them to help us with, or a demand that their own choice of license said they couldn't make. Uh, from the modest perspective, we were just a nuisance that uh, led unsophisticated users to come and use their mods and make annoying support, support requests and complaints. Uh, the situation slowly built until a significant proportion of mod authors was talking about taking steps either through licensing changes or <coughs> technical means to prevent the CCAN from including their mods. Uh, there were threads in the KSB forums, an issue was raised in the GitHub repository and a huge argument ensued. Now, the mod authors were critical stakeholders. They had the power to make the CCAN useless. And we weren't adequately considering their expectations and interests in the project. Stakeholders can be upstream of the project, providers of components, materials, or funds, or they can be downstream, such as users of the system. Or they can be mutually dependent with, this, with the project. We were treating the mod authors as upstreams, as providers, but we needed to recognize they were mutually dependent stakeholders. What, we did affected them significantly too. Things were getting pretty ugly. So, with things looking grim and some major and extremely popular modders about to start doing the internet thing and routing around us, I suggested a compromise, a recognition that the CCAN wasn't just downloading mods, it was also installing them, which gave a moral justification for the mod authors to tell us to go jump. I proposed a change to the delisting policy to say that any mod author could ask us to stop <coughs> installing their mod. Uh, and that we would therefore delist FOSS mods in that case, at least until we implement some system to download and let users do a manual install, which we haven't quite gotten around to yet. <laughs> the feedback from Mozers was pos positive, but they knew that I wasn't the one calling the shots. Now, I just had to get the rest of the CCAN team on board. So if you want your project to thrive, stakeholders matter. You've got to identify them, find and communicate the common points of interest between you and your stakeholders to get them cooperating with you rather than frustrating you. Both the modders and the KSPC can wanted to get users running the latest compatible version of mods installed as designed. That shared desire may ultimately make cooperation possible. Stakeholders can be your best friends, and stakeholders can be your worst enemies. And the great thing about leading projects is you get to decide which. Now, if FOSS projects are self-organising then, where does leadership fit in? What makes a FOSS leader? Technically strong contributions are critical. You won't become a leader without it. But they're not actually what the, the important thing 
The important things are the other things that we've been talking about. Um, being an active member of the uh, team's organisation, participating in discussions, attending meetings, meeting people face to face if you possibly can. I know that a lot of is made of the fact that uh, FOSS projects are virtual. People actually mostly don't like that. If they can meet people at least once, it's a good thing. Information connections across project modules and across other projects. These are very valuable additions. We've talked about that already. But the other thing is the organisation building behaviours that contribute to success, the coordination and the recruitment and induction that we've talked about, developing people, <coughs> being a guardian, focusing and uh, fostering the goals of the project. There's a series of roles that support those uh, behaviours, but that's the es essence of leadership in a FOSS project. So where do they come from? And typically, as we said earlier, initially the leaders are the founders. Interestingly, in FOSS projects, leadership is often shared. And sometimes that's like a technical leader and a management leader, or an organisational or a relational leader. Sometimes that's people who've got very similar um, in inputs. But one of the beautiful things about having more than one person is, of course, that it protects the project from loss. It's a very powerful way to run things if you possibly can. Leaders will always come from the core, always, because they have to have demonstrated their technical competence to, in fact, line up. But they can step back to the periphery without losing their leadership status. Linus Torvalds would probably be the outstanding example of that. And over the life of the project, not only who, but also the, the how of the leadership will change, the style can change. In virtual teams such as FOSS projects, we know that style matters. Different styles will lead to different impacts on the participants' behaviour. One way of thinking about this, and it came out of some quite th thorough research, um, it, it, it aligns very nicely with Conway's law, quite coincidentally. Um, it talks in terms of a product or a technical focus being high or low, and then it talks about an organisational focus being high or low. And of course, the person with the high organisational focus and the high technical focus is the kind of visionary leader that you expect to see um, guiding a very hands-on way. A person with the lower technical focus but still with the high organisational focus tends to be more focused on the relationships between this project and another between the participants within the team. And then you have the second line where the organisational focus is low but they're very interested in the technical side. And that's our classic tech lead. Um, you've all met that person. And then finally, there's the hands-off leader who's very low on organisational and product focus. FOSS project, self-evolve, the team know what they're doing, hands-off, leave it to the team to, to organise themselves. There are four valid models of project leadership. But the really interesting thing is this. In those studies that I'm referring to there in the literature, not once was somebody from the bottom line drawn. Only people who were in the visionary or the relational uh, lines of types uh, with high organisational focus were actually selected for leadership. I think people know that you need both halves, and I don't know about you, but I got into code cutting because it meant I didn't have to think about people. I loved the code, I loved the computers. I, I mean, it was, but we all know that we've got to have both halves. And if somebody else is prepared to put their hand up and do it, then I'm prepared to vote for them. As it evolves, the project will need different kinds of leadership. In an R&D project uh, team, radical technical leadership will set the project up for success. Remember, I talked about some of those technicalities earlier with the KSP CKN. But even after the, the system is stable, you still need very clear technical direction. You need somebody to make sure that the technical vision is not compromised by year after year of maintenance requests, bug fixes, workarounds being put in place. You still need that technical understanding and focus, but it's where do you put your emotional effort and the time. And finally, any leader, any style. Anybody can be a leader of any of these styles. It depends on what is required, context and circumstances. But for FOSS projects, it's got to be that red line, high organisational focus. So, with, uh, with no definitive negative team from the CCAN team members and not a lot of responsive, responsive at all, uh, the tension mounting, 
Uh, eventually, I declared that while I still had commit privileges to the repository, I was going to act as though my proposal had been accepted. Uh, I started pulling mods, as the authors asked, including one critical mod that was a dependency for nearly half the mods in the uh, CKN system. I uh, effectively broke the CKN for a couple of days. And I hated doing that. I really hated every bit of it. And I was fully expecting to be tossed out of the CKN team. Uh, I just couldn't see any other way forward at the time. Uh, was it a coup? Did I take over the project? Sort of, yes, in that I changed the project's policies and acted unilaterally. I took on the de facto leadership of the project, certainly in the eyes of the KSP forum community. Uh, and it certainly solved the immediate problem with our stakeholders. Uh, but the flat nature of the project, project structure and the general be bold, it can always be reverted or tweaked, uh, culture of the team means that I really didn't. After all, I didn't have admin privileges to anything and I didn't take any steps to seize actual control of any of the repositories. Uh, I made it as easy as I could to have everything I was doing be reversed. And this was a critical test of the project leadership. PJF had several choices. As the founder and project leader, he could choose to reject my policy change and pull things back into the stakeholder crisis we'd been in, or he could accept the changes and continue on as a compromised leader with broken authority. Uh, but instead, he did one of the most important things a leader can do. He let go. Uh, and more than that, he made a lengthy post explaining why he was stepping down as project leader, uh, suggesting that the team should select a new leader and adopt a regular leadership renewal process, and proposed me as the new mission director. Uh, no one else in the team was put forward as an alternative, and uh, so I became the official KSB CKN mission director. And all of this happened over a period of just a few days. And then PJF almost entirely dropped out of the project, at least publicly. Different leadership styles, as Anne said, suit different phases in a project life cycle. When things are changing rapidly, you want a visionary style, combining technical and organisational skills. Once you've got a stable release and are looking to ensure things keep running or gradually improving, the organisational focus takes a greater share of importance. Now, I'm not the same kind of leader as PJF was, so there was a definite change of leadership style there. PJF founded the project as a charismatic, visionary style leader with excellent hacking credentials and a great smile. That's exactly the kind of leadership needed to bring a project into existence, to transform it from vision to reality. And the KSBC can got such a great start because of his excellent leadership abilities. But for the last few months of his time leading the CKN, since the code base had mostly settled down, PJF had stepped back into the periphery and effectively switched to a more hands-off style. Uh, and at that moment, at that stakeholder crisis moment, we really needed a solid organisational focus. Uh, in contrast, I've been operating with a more relational style leader, keeping things running and trying to use all the things that I've learned from PJF's excellent example, management, training, and years of working in mostly business as usual roles. Now, I'm certainly not leading on the technical side. We've got a few solid techie folks handling that side and who aren't interested in the organisational side of things, and so I generally leave the technical decisions to them. Any leadership transition is a period of uncertainty and minimising the elapsed time may well enhance stability. A clear and public succession from one leader to another is certainly better for a project than an acrimonious fork uh, and means your team pool doesn't get divided, though any transition is going to lead to some changes. We lost one team member immediately due to individual clashes with me, while some others drifted away over time. Now, would they have stuck around if PJF had continued as a fairly hands-off leader? It's hard to say. Uh, but PJF's public handover of leadership meant that team members weren't divided based on me versus him. Uh, it transformed the personal loyalties into a team loyalties. The literature doesn't have a lot of data on leadership transitions in FOSS projects, so it's difficult to compare 
with other cases, but some points emerge from the literature that give support to key aspects of the KSB CCAN transition that could assist in achieving smooth leadership transitions. Uh, we know leadership transitions are difficult times for any organisation, and corporate leadership succession generally happens over a time scale of months. Now, the relatively successful KSP CCAN transition happened closer to the reported time scale of military coups, such as uh, Chile in 1973 or Mali in 2012. This suggests, though perhaps not strongly, that the continue that similar short time frames for leadership transition may be useful in assisting projects to uh, maintain stability. Uh, examination of the transition from Castro's charismatic leadership of Cuba identified limited participation of a predecessor as being important in a smooth change. The same study showed that continuation of loyalty networks is also key to a smooth transfer of leadership. Leadership crises may occur in FOSS projects because there's no system in place for changing leaders. Uh, another study suggested that establishing or varying succession rules may assist in stabilising a transition. That combination of a clear but limited handover, a short time frame, and establishing succession rules certainly worked for the KSBC can. We started by asking the question, how does leadership assist FOSS projects to succeed? And it comes down to two key points. Firstly, in a crisis, you are not looking to win the, the war. You're looking to achieve and plan for post-crisis stability, whatever that takes. To avoid crisis, maintain the focus on the relationships, especially with the periphery. A strong periphery is associated with success. Encourage new people, support future developers and your future leaders. In a major study, the strongest predictor of the success was having the tag fields on the website populated. Now, nobody thinks for a moment that the, the population of the fields was actually what created the project's success. What it suggests is that there was a very clear vision that was able to be written down. The leader had that vision. There was a very clear amount of diligence to people who were prepared to put that effort in right back at the beginning of the project when it didn't have any, nobody was looking. And that diligence sets the project up for success later on when it's critical. And it indicates a focus on the people that you're trying to make it easy for them to find your project through searching and to attract into your periphery and then eventually into your core. If you want just one takeaway from us, review the state of your project's public face, the tags, the website, from the perspective of the periphery that you want to attract and support. That is probably the first best thing you can do to lead your project to success. Any questions, please? If you have any second thoughts, email addresses will be on the website and the reference list for what we've been talking about today is available at that tiny URL. Uh, you're welcome to download it and be in touch if you'd like to get hold of any of the uh, papers to, to do any follow-up reading. Thank you. Thank you, Anne and Mike. Um, we have a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much Thank for speaking much. at LCA this year. Thank, Thank you. you.